Yes. And I, I wasn't going to order a thousand. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, as, I, I, as I was saying, uh, Hans needs no introduction. He's going to give us a talk on, uh, um, I've got to get the title correctly, Proliferation of Non-Amateur CubeSat. He's then going to run on into a general IRU uh, discussion forum. Uh, Hans, for those who, doesn't, who don't know, is the global um, IARU satellite frequency coordinator. Is that the right, is that the right, is that the right words? And uh, I don't envy his job at all. Over to you, Hans. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, to me it was quite nostalgic when I um, heard about the balloon flight because I think a lot of you uh, wouldn't remember. But many years ago, one of the first presentations which I ever gave in an AMSAT colloquium, uh, I had lots of hair. Martin Sweeting's, Martin Sweeting was still wet behind the ears. And we talked about back our balloon carrying amateur radio and we had a number of those projects in South Africa at the time uh, very successful but obviously you know I mean those days there were no miniaturized components there were there was no um, video yet uh, yeah, any of those things hadn't been invented or developed and there was a lot of interest here and then Ron Broadbent said listen you will never ever have you got a problem Carry on. Okay, you will never ever be able to do a balloon launch in the UK because the government will definitely not allow it. Well, I see there's been quite a few since. And um, of course, they've become more sophisticated. And I see a lot of balloon launches all over the world uh, happening right now. Keep going. Okay, well, I need my slides now. Oh, that was just to say. And well done uh, to the uh, Electronic and Amateur Radio Club. But uh, here in Surrey, I, I think you did a great project because what you did is, is also extend it to the community and, and do those sort of things. Are we there? No. Well, we were on the screen, but... <laughs> now, you see, that's all about technology. It, it, it always works every time. It never fails. It never gives hassles. <laughs> Maybe you must rather the, use the, f the $50, I mean $200 satellite, uh, because that seems to work better. <laughs> but it's always these, these kind of things, uh, and uh, yeah, I was worried about that. <laughs> Does it work? No. It gets smaller and smaller on the screen. Yeah, now you've got it, but I haven't got it. That's very rude to talk like that. I'm supposed to talk to you guys. Okay, amateur radio. Don't know what happened, but that's not the slide that was supposed to start with. Okay, right. I'm going to talk about proliferation of non-amateur cube sets and the impact that it has on on amateur radio. Uh, if you just think about amateur radio and cube sets. Cubesat projects at universities promote amateur radio. That was a general kind of message that we were giving the amateur radio community. And maybe it was true when the first few Cubesats were developed. But then, that's not generally been shown in practice. And I'm going to show you why. And it is a very worrying idea uh, that we have now. Many of these projects are based on commercially acquired Cubesats with often no amateur radio involvement at all. They buy the CubeSet, they develop their science project, but nobody actually involved in the project has any idea about satellites, has any idea about RF, about radio technology at all. And that's, that, that's really a problem because they come to us and they say, please coordinate the frequency. We say, well, you have to be able to turn that satellite off if there's a problem. How? But don't ask me. I'm not developing the satellite. 
Amateur radio frequencies are the easy way out. And if you want a quick telemetry feedback, then ask radio amateurs. So there's a lot of interest, obviously, in university and other scientific organizations to use amateur frequencies because, A, you not only have an easy way of getting your, your frequencies, but you also have a huge community that will be only too keen to receive the signal as a challenge and feed you with the telemetry. So what do you want? I mean, it's the ideal world that we have created. But there are too many satellites and too few frequencies today. Amateur radio bands are being overcrowded by non-amateur satellites. I mean, QB50, tube sets, orbiting PC, you, you name them, there's a whole lot of new $50 satellites. $200 satellite, are you going to change the name? All right, $50 satellite, I'll stick with that. I like the concept, by the way. <laughs> Some include projects that may have application in amateur radio, and that's nice. And we always try to encourage that, uh, to try and say, well, if you want us to coordinate, you want to use our frequencies, then make something that's of interest to, to radio amateurs as well. Try and include something, or maybe it... You know, what often happens is they launch this CubeSat, and if it's successful, many of them, of course, never actually make it. I won't tell you what I normally say when that happens. But many of them never make it. But those that do make it, after about a month or two months, you find the university people have lost interest. Now, if they could then turn that over into an amateur radio project, it would be far more of interest because at least you wouldn't be occupying those frequencies and just keep on sending the same telemetry over and over which nobody is actually looking at and fulfilling no, no purpose. But that seldom happens. Many payloads are just of no interest to amateur radio. I mean, if, if, you, if we look at some of the payloads, and I know, you know the panel that coordinates frequencies, and we have people from the US, we have people from the UK, Germany, and I tell you a little bit about them later. And then we also have uh, uh, a guy in Japan. And the question we get asked every time when we get this request, say, but, but this is not amateur radio. Why aren't they in another band? CubeSats have been developed as a low-cost entry into space for experimentation, putting further pressure, particularly on our two-meter segment. The combination of low-cost amateur and commercial radios along with 3 IU frequency coordination have made this band very attractive to university and even commercial experimenters. There are now some requests we get for frequencies which are purely commercial. The guy wants to develop something, they want to prove it works, and then they want to sell it. The only problem is, is when they want to sell it, of course, now we get more people wanting to use amateur frequencies because that's basically the package they're trying to sell. Because most regulators actually don't understand and they don't really want to allocate frequencies or, or, or supply frequencies. So what they do is they say, use ham radio. They've got lots of spectrum. So if we look at IU, we have a band plan. The coordinated band plans in all three regions with small variations. There are some uh, variations between region 1, 2 and 3. Uh, and I think the most developed band plan is still in this region, Region 1, and I think Region 2 is, is, is following quite nicely, and so is Region 3 actually also coming into, into the way you know, Region 1 has been, been actually spearheading this band plan for many years. And uh, the whole idea was is that, that of course, it, it has to uh, maximize usage and minimize interference between various types of operation. Now, there's an interesting discussion that took place in the U.S. because the FCC in the U.S. all of a sudden realized, but hang on, it's actually quite illegal in terms of ITU regulations to use amateur frequencies or amateur licensing. So what they said is, okay, we will, uh, we will issue or you can apply for an experimental license. Now an experimental license has one problem, and that is, is it's not allowed to be communicating out of your area. So if you have an experiment lost in the U.S., you may not communicate with anybody out the U.S. unless there's a reciprocal agreement signed between the governments. So we had a discussion and we said to, to, to uh, the SEC, but guys, 
the 2 meter band is not from 144 to, one for, uh, to, to 146 or 148 in some areas. The satellite segment is only 200 kilohertz. Uh oh. They didn't think so. So the first few experimental licenses, they were telling the guys that you can go anywhere in a 2 meter band, that's fine. And that's when we came up after lots of discussion and say, well, maybe we must stop coordinating all non-amateur satellites. But there's a big danger in that because as the FCC's understanding was that it's a huge band, so was a lot of other people. And what would happen is we would get all these signals coming into all our terrestrial communication systems as well. And it could just play havoc with repeaters and whatever. So we have one allocation, of course, 144 to 145, you know, is, is, is worldwide. The other areas have a bit more. And it's actually 145 point, uh, what's it, uh, 999, so 146. Uh, and the satellite allocation in there is, is 145, 800 to 146. And the other interesting thing is, is we get requests, and they're asking for us for 145,995. Now, clearly, with Doppler, that's going to be out the band. But they keep on saying, well, why can't we use that? Right, um, there's also the new link, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that a bit later on, um, uh, which um, hasn't quite been sort of finalized. Uh, some interesting developments there that's going to happen at the IAU Region 1 conference that's taking place. Um, where? Somewhere in the east, uh, Eastern Europe. That's right. Nice place. Right. The most use of all VHM bands accommodates, in UTAC 2 meter band is the most used, it accommodates weak uh, terrestrial signals, moon bounce, packet radio systems, including APRS, propagation beacons, repeater systems, satellite communication. You find it's a very useful band and it's used very widely. Now I'm stuck here. Yep. Some administration, notably the US, as I explained to you, decided the licensing of university and commercial research missions in the amateur satellite service does not comport with the definition of, of the amateur service in terms of the ITU. So instead of doing, uh, uh, instead of licensing as provided the experimental stations according to ART 27, despite they're having no status with regard to causing or harmful interference. And that's another thing. If, if a, a non-amateur satellite operates in amateur frequencies, they now sign a declaration with us to say, if they cause interference, we can demand them to switch off immediately. In other words, we're trying to protect the amateur service in that way. Whether or no that's going to happen, I don't know. We, we fortunately have not had that kind of necessity to do that. But it may well happen as we get more and more. Right, so the IU to the rescue. When the US administration changed their licensing policy and many CubeSats originally coordinated as amateur satellite stations were already built and manifested for launch, we decided we will actually sort out their frequencies. Even if they use 2 meter uplinks or 2 meter downlinks, we will uh, assist them in doing that, seeing a lot of these they were quite in a problem because when that regulation changed in the US, and it only applies to the US, the launch agency said, but hang on, unless you have a letter from the IOU that you are frequency coordinated, we will not manifest you on our launch. So there was a big scramble uh, for, for one of the uh, Ilana launches that was taking place within about two months after that decision was taken. They would have been denied their launch in, 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 uh, at all. Uh, and after consulting widely, a set of terms and conditions to accommodate experimental stations on a temporary basis was devised. And look at the word temporary, because we believe that ultimately the world needs to go back to the drawing board and look for frequency spectrum or spectrum for those experimental university commercial experimental satellites. They, need to, they cannot live in the amateur band forever, because there are too many of them already. And, and it's just creating, it's creating a bit of chaos. All right, so 
we held the view all the time that non-amateur satellites, that are satellites missions inconsistent with radio regulations 1.5 and, and, and 1.57 should not be coordinated in the amateur service in amateur radio service frequency bands. Therefore, the IU recommends that these CubeSat builders look at bands allocated to existing services appropriate for their mission rather than the 2 meter band. Now, there are other frequency bands within the ITU band plan that could be used for certain of these scientific missions. But hey, it's so easy. Just tell them to use the amateur bands. You don't have any more paperwork. You explain sailing, and the administrations don't have to wreck their brains of how to, how to facilitate this. So beginning of this month, we are no longer able to accept frequency coordination requests for experimental stations in the 2 meter band. However, we will continue to coordinate frequencies in a 2 meter band for satellites that carry true amateur radio payloads. Now that also means is that like some of those applications that we've made much earlier, like the QB50 set of, of CubeSets, we will still coordinate where we cannot convince them that they shouldn't be using uh, the, two the, the 2 meter uplink. Um, as an interim solutions, we think, well, there's a 1260, 1270 megahertz band, but it's not actually being used, and, and why aren't we looking at, at using that particular unused spectrum, or hardly used spectrum, put it that way. Uh, as I said, it's, it's not envisaged that uh, uh, coordination will set any precedence. We, we believe that we made it quite clear, and we're also actively participating, or the IU is, in, in discussions to find solutions to the problem. And there are some discussions going to take place at WRC 15, but it may not be until the following one, uh, because there is no particular agenda item at the moment. So we still provide coordination to two meter band to the best of our ability for experimental cube sets that are already designed and built. So therefore, you know, we, we don't expect people to, to scrap that, but we are trying to encourage them where possible to change. Some of them are frequency agile enough to, tr to swap around, some not. And the I, uh, and that frequency coordination application form is fully completed and signed by the licensee or authorized representative for experiment, experimental license and payloads. Now, the terms and conditions are that the licensee agrees the following conditions, and, and you can see there's a whole lot of conditions. And, and basically the main condition is, and I'm not going to read for all of those, but the main condition is basically is that it may not cause interference to any other coordinated satellite and no uh, uh, um, amateur radio ground operation. Or, yeah. uh, and, and so these conditions go on. It also says that it must be fitted with something that, and, and I'm very impressed with, your, uh, with the $50 satellite that you actually have heeded to the requirements in the IT regulation that it actually you need to be able to switch it off. There's many of these experimental satellites that don't. The argument is, oh, well, the battery will run out. But that's not acceptable in, in terms of ITU. Right, that, there's, another, that there's enough control stations or, or, or stations around the world that be able to, to actually perform that, that, that particular function. And um, there's a whole lot of uh, um, other, other kind of like uh, conditions uh, that uh, allows me to decline and saying you're not meeting those requirements and that frequencies in the amateur and amateur satellite services are shared. And <laughs> you'd be surprised. I get some prop that write to me and says, but you've also allocated the, or coordinated the same frequency to another university in the U.S. and I'm in Japan and, and I want my own personal frequency. Well, it's not possible because the amateur service is a shared service. Can you just imagine? I mean, where can you provide a, 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 a private frequency in, in the 2 meter band or even today in the 70 centimeter band and say, you can have that exclusively. I mean, it's just, but they don't really understand what amateur radio is about, and, and that's the kind of things that they have to now sign for. It does not guarantee, as I said, that the same frequency will not be a licensed. And also, uh, that the licensee agrees to notify the IU uh, whenever the experimental station license expires, when they have a launch failure, uh, mission termination, and launch date in coordination request passes without the launch occurring. Now, we have a big problem with that because, you know, once we've issued a coordination letter, many times, that's the last time we ever hear, we don't know where it was successfully launched unless you check Mike's website. Normally, you can find it there. 
But I mean, the onus is really on those people to advise us, to say, we've launched, it's successful, it's not successful, this is a problem, uh, satellites in decay, it's not going to re-enter, or it has re-entered. We're often in the dark, <coughs> or mainly time in the dark, unless, and Mike is very good at picking those up, far better than any of us are. <laughs> us are. Maybe we're all too busy trying to do the paperwork instead of spending time on, 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 on this thing. But thanks for that, Mike. Uh, now, come on. Uh, this, and, and so we continue with, with a lot of these, these conditions. And, and mean to us as radio amateurs, a lot of these are, are just common sense. Uh, we've gone through all that. Uh, we've gone through that. And we have appeal. Those guys that are producing these satellite kits, guys, please look at other amateur then frequencies until such time as the ITU has managed to organize and, and arrange different frequencies. You know, the ITU process is extremely slow. So we understand you cannot tell every university or, or research institution, listen, hang on, you cannot launch a satellite because we will not allow you to use amateur frequencies. Now, in the U.S. it's controlled. In other countries, it's not. Uh, I mean, many of the authorities just don't understand what amateur radio is about. They find it's an easy way. And in some countries, people go ahead and don't even advise their local administration they actually are using amateur frequencies. They normally use an amateur license, and you find out that the person that they quote as the licensee actually was just notified, and he's actually not involved in the project. So I appeal to, to those guys that produce these commercial kits. Look at other frequencies. This don't stick to only 2 meters and 70 centimeters because we're going to run out of space there. There are many other frequencies still available that you could, you could use until such time as, as, as the frequencies are being coordinated by the ITU for, in, other, in other bands. And there are other bands available. There's a continued changing around. You know, I mean, at one stage, uh, everybody uh, wanted HF, and then everybody wanted VHF, and the commercial world wanted UHF. Now they don't even want it anymore. Now they're looking at the centimeter bands. So that's a problem, of course, that amateur radio frequencies are always under challenge, because there's always somebody that wants to take the slice that, that we have. And uh, yeah, that's another, of course, issue is that unless we are using the frequencies that are allocated to us, we, we have a far bigger chance of, of, of actually finding commercial interest, making enough noise to actually get those frequencies. And we see this now in many countries on the 70 centimeter band where, you know, the bands in some countries become smaller and smaller and, 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 and kind of things like that happen. So that's really our, our appeal uh, to, to the, uh, and also we encourage customers to work with AMSA groups and National Amateur Radio Societies. In other words, if a guy, if, if a university wants to build uh, uh, to do a scientific project on, on a CubeSat. Try and involve the local amateur radios, uh, radio amateurs or the local society in that. Because A, you may get expertise that you haven't got. So team up with your scientists that want to do their payload of growing seeds or growing flowers on a satellite and, and, and send down some, some telemetry. Team up with the local ra amateur radio group team up with an SAM set, I mean, or an MSET group in your country, MSET UK, MSET NA, I mean, there's lots of MSET groups in the world now. Team up with them and get them to support you or bring some expertise on board that have understanding of, of RF, of uh, operations like that. And, and that's really, you know, what we believe that even when, when a supplier supplies, and I know they're in the business of supplying equipment, but encourage these people that you supplied it to, hey, Contact your local amateur radio group. That can be a lot of use to you, a lot of assistance to you. And I think that's really basic, the story on, on that. So, yeah, thank you. To say I use working with national societies in the interest of amateur radio, and national societies need to start playing their part also by, by engaging their regulatory authorities by helping them understand where we are going as, as radio amateurs. And in some countries, I think there's a pretty good relationship between Ofcom and RSGB and, and, and MSET UK. I think you guys are interacting here. And you find in the FCC and ARL are, are interacting a lot. But in many countries, there is absolutely no contact.
between the National Society, the MSET group, and the, and the regulator. And that's where our biggest danger lies in the future. We have too many CubeSets and too few frequencies. Thank you. Thanks, Hans. In terms of general discussion um, mode about IARU satellite coordination, but do you have any specific questions on what, on what Hans has said so far? There must be on the yeah, I'll go and get that one. None for the floor. We'll go to the internet. Excuse me. Well, while well, Jim is going there, uh, our next discussion is just an open discussion on 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 that, and I'd just like to. Uh, is to say thank you to the team that supports me and some of them are here Mike is here today thank you very much Mike and Graham is, is here today and the other guys maybe they're watching uh, we have uh, two people in the US uh, Art Feller and we also have um, and I, I don't have a slide of those names on and we also have Lee uh, who supports us and then we have Suzuo in, in, the, um, in Japan uh, that actually part of the team so we actually meet on a regular basis and that's quite a challenge because of the time differences and we all have to work most of us have to work so you know it was very good in the old days when we we only had european based participation in the u.s because we could do it at night because the time zones are about the same but now we have a problem that we have to do it midday to accommodate both u.s and to accommodate japan uh, at a reasonable time so the u.s complains because it's at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. Japan is 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. And for us in, in, the, in, in, in the UK, in, in um, Germany, it, it is like in the middle of the day. So it's lunchtime or whatever. And of course, one of the guys I didn't mention was Graham. Uh, and he plays a very important Thanks, part. Now, so okay. Uh, there are three questions. The last one first, if I may. Uh, have you got any examples of um, the, what you might describe as the good practice that you'd like to see introduced? Recent examples? There are the, yeah, I, I think there are good practices uh, in, 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 some, in, in, in some of the uh, organizations that, that do that. I mean, we've learned about a good practice today from the, the, the $50 satellite, which, which understands that you need to be able to control the, the satellite and be able to switch it off should something go wrong and we have those good practices we also have a good practice in some organizations say well we only have an interest for six weeks or eight or two months or three months but we will include a way in making it more attractive or, or include a transponder and we've seen a couple of those um, I think that the, maybe the other good practices that uh, some of these institutions are starting to understand better. They realize they're actually squatting, if you like, on, on amateur frequencies. They shouldn't be there. So they become more accommodating, and they will accept that we say, well, look, you can't be on this frequency, but hey, this frequency would be better suited. So yeah, we do get that cooperation Just from some. Just one more question, and this is from... Uh uh, VU3TYG. He's saying we are seeing commercial startups using amateur frequencies for uplinks and telemetry. Do you think approving such requests will risk us losing uh, frequencies? And just to finish off, uh, several people of Earth would like to thank you for your presentation. Well, thank to all the people that have been w watching. Uh, maybe they could see the picture better than I can. I still have this black screen in front of me. I hope somebody's going to fix it so I can use my laptop tonight. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, it is a danger, uh, and that's why we, we make it quite clear in every non-amateur application on, on our letter saying, yes, we have coordinated the frequency, though, and though. we also tell them what we expect them to do, and we say, well, in terms of the ITU regulations, number one, you know, the, the different ones, uh, you are not strictly speaking uh, in terms of the ITU uh, permitted to use amateur frequencies, so therefore you need to discuss this with your regulator. So what we're doing is we're sending those people back to their own regulators. Whether they ever do, we don't know, because it, you know it, it, we're all a voluntary organisation. So if you get like 30, 40 requests some months, you can't just like 
you know, follow up too much on that, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, there is a danger, and that's why we're continually saying, well, we need to pursue with different regulators through IAUs and national societies to say that some of these satellites need to find their own spaces in, in the frequency domain, and, 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 and we, we need to assist in working. And there's some working groups uh, at, at um, ITU that have been talking about these kind of things. And yeah, maybe in the next 10 years we will find that some people will get their own spectrum and that the amateur bands remain amateur. Yeah, in some countries, the regulators take action. I remember the time that, um, what was it, the, the watch people, they wanted to launch some stuff and, and that actually, uh, one of the governments involved in that, she stopped it and said, no, 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 that's not going to happen on amateur frequency. And thanks very much for that, for uh, uh, entertaining and informative talk. Um, I'd like to everyone to show their appreciation for it. Thank you very much. We'll now go on for this.